just watched Thunderfoot's latest rather remarkable video. And the question that occurs to me is, what is his end game? This is a question we ask of politicians when dealing in foreign affairs, and we expect an answer. We don't expect to go into things without some idea of how we're going to come out and how we're going to wrap things up and how we're going to solve problems in the longer term. So this is my question to Thunderfoot. What is his end game? Do you even have an end game here? You see, it seems to me that the real problem we have here, underlying all of this, is the state of the religion of Islam, and that it needs to be reformed. It needs to be made into a, a form that can actually allow it to fit in with the rest of the world. I think everybody agrees with that, the people that would class themselves as the militants and the people that don't. Everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet. But I've got to point out that no heartfelt ideology has ever been reformed down the barrel of a gun. There may very well be a place, a political place, for being militant and for being militant against some some, I, some uh, Islamic theocracies, but you don't solve an ideology itself by being militant. There comes a time where you actually have to have some kind of a dialogue. And bombing people and burning their idols really doesn't help when it comes to that kind of dialogue. Having said all of that, let's be honest, the dialogue is not going to be between uh, militant Islamists and the likes of Thunderfoot or the likes of myself. If the dialogue is going to take place at all, it's going to take place between the militant Islamists and the moderate Muslims. And I know there's some people that, that dispute that there's even such a thing as a moderate Muslim on the grounds that a moderate Muslim isn't as moderate as a very mild-mannered Anglican vicar. Well, yes, I accept that. In the, in the scheme of things, comparability-wise, moderate Muslims are not always as moderate as the most moderate Christians, but they're still the best that you're going to get right now. That's what you've got to work with. And every time you're going to burn an effigy of the Prophet Muhammad, every time we embark on these rather uh, extravagantly expressed militaristic appeals, what we do is one of two things. We push some of those moderates back towards the extremists. And the other thing we do is those moderates that remain, we just make things harder for them. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves here. How many of us would want to be moderate Muslims trying to reform our religion? I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to have to tackle some of these almost intractable problems. I wouldn't want to have to deal with these militant Islamists and try and bring them round and, and drag them kicking and screaming into the modern world. So why make that even harder? That really just doesn't make any sense. Because one thing we know through history is that eventually, if you want to reform something like that, it has to be done through some kind of dialogue. That's the only way that it happens. That's the only way that you eventually win some kind of heart and minds campaign. Why make that impossible? And if you're going to make that impossible, Thunderfoot, what's your end game? What's your proposal? Is it going to be some kind of global brainwashing scheme? I don't know. That's what I would like to find out. What I want to do finally is just to show you where militancy leads by reference to a comment I made and a reply I got from a user. I've never done this before. I never dragged a comment up like this before, but I'm going to do it now. This is a reply I received from a guy called Help Me I'm Being. I think he's missed a cunt off the end of his name. You'll see why. I made a comment about Northern Ireland and how dialogue had actually worked in Northern Ireland. How decades of bombings and shootings and terrorism how we've benefited actually from having dialogue. At first the dialogue was all hush hush. Neither side wanted to talk about it. The IRA leaders weren't talking about it because they knew they would be condemned. The British government didn't talk about it because they knew they would be condemned. And it's been one of the best things that's ever happened for that re region. Let me read his reply when I made this, this comment. Uh, to Noel Plum 99, they recently shot and killed two British soldiers, injuring civilians in the process, and have planted explosives that have failed to detonate. So much for diplomacy. You give everything away to these people. Coward. Now, the reason I'm showing this comment is to make the point, not just to help me I'm being, but to everybody else who advocates a militancy-only approach, that... 
in Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland, there were other people who, just like him, said, you'd give everything away to these people. Coward. And do you know what became of these people? Well, they formed the Continuity IRA, they formed the Real IRA, and they're the cunts that are doing the bombing that he is so mad about. If he wants to know what one of these bombers or a potential bomber looks like, all he needs to do is invest in a mirror and angle it towards his face because it's the people with the same kind of approach as him but on the other side of the fence that are the problem that he's talking about. There's nothing wrong, listen, if you're all for a bit of militancy, there's nothing wrong with a bit of militancy when it's placed correctly. But advocating a militancy only policy in the long term is doomed to failure. There has to be some dialogue and we have to look at everything we do in terms of not making that dialogue even harder. God knows it's hard enough. Thank you for listening.